19th of September, 1944. Before the first ray is visible in the eastern sky, Hocker and I stand at the latrine and inspect the fence. Relieved, I tell Hocker that nothing has changed, but there are more latrines with copper wire in this large camp. There is no shortage of men with understanding and good ideas. Restlessly, the fear of competition drives me around the compound until finally the sun overcomes endless Russia and lights the western half of Europe. Without delay, we begin our work. The six-feet-long tubing is cut into two equal parts in a few minutes. With a sharp-edged stone squeezed between our knees, each of us begins rasping away the ridges on the tubing. With strength and endurance that none of us would have expected any more, we continue to work the material over the sharp stone under strong pressure. Before the first one heads to the latrine, I hold two six-inch long pieces of tubing in my hand. Now we must separate ourselves, Willie. No one can notice the context of our work. Under no circumstances can anyone get the picture that we are working on rings. In case of an emergency, you can explain to the all-too-curious that the wire was forgotten by the work detail, and you are going to make a hook for your cans. I will sit at my usual writing place behind the tent, where no one is inclined to disturb me since I have already driven the gapers from that place. I will bend the rings. No one can surprise me because I only keep one tool in my hand and all the others in my pocket, something that I advise to all of you. I make my way to my usual writing place behind the tent, where Hocker has placed the iron bar and a red sandstone, which is very good for my work. Industriously, but without haste, I begin to grind the surface of a piece of copper to give it the necessary half-round form. I only interrupt the work on one if it gets too hot because of rubbing too fast, and then continue with the second one. After considerable time, the first success is apparent. The pieces have been shaped into their half-round form. Nearly crazy with joy, I rub the deepest scratches out with moist sand until they sparkle before me from the first rays of sunshine. Bathed in sweat, I suddenly become dizzy and nearly black out as I begin to smooth and polish the ends. My tired hands no longer obey my will. Exhausted, I drop the tubing to the ground. I feel like I'm going to faint. Before my closed eyes dance thick slices of corned beef and a heaping box of biscuits. Water, I stammer from my dried mouth before I completely pass out. But it could only have been a few seconds that I was unconscious. Then I see the same picture of sun and wind as I open my eyes again. Only a laming weakness makes me aware of my true physical condition. It is high time that we take our fate in our own hands, and an outflowing of hate against the rich Americans who trample around this island of misery like fat pigs, withholding the most necessary provisions from us, drives me to continue to work. Filled with sheer rage and the satanic anticipation that in a short time I will stick it to them with their own copper tubing, I bend the first ring around the iron bar and hammer the ends tightly together with a round stone. Becoming ice cold inside, I peel the nearly finished ring from the iron bar with considerable effort and contemplate my work with satisfaction. With ill-concealed wrath, I proceed with the finishing work. All the dents and scratches are eliminated by careful rubbing with sandstone, which is not any rougher than a middle-range grinding stone that is used in any workshop. The final work involves the use of sand and wet dirt. I watch to see that the ring does not open and that it retains its brightness, brought out by polishing it on the buckskin seat of my pants. So, I have earned the first meal in captivity. Now I will test it. Quickly I change my authentic ring with the false one and go to my friends, whom I find are not working diligently. Man, this is a shitty job. Brilla receives me. Really shitty work. Helmut, Hocker joins in, and I feel like boxing their ears. How far did you get? I ask in a harmless tone. Each one has cut through one, but we wasted a lot of time trying to find a better method, Hocker answers me shamelessly. Abu fools, I jump on them. Don't you believe that I did not do it before you? There is no other possibility here. I hope that you did not tramp around the compound with the wire and ask for a saw or pliers. Not that, but we wanted to ask a soldier from the provisions tent for some pincers. 
Unfortunately, there has been a guard on the main road since this morning, where they are just finishing a guardhouse, Brilla confesses in the most harmless manner this attempt of unbelievably stupid proportions. Just continue to work so that your brain can finally get some nourishment, since it has suffered great need in the last while, as I can tell by the way you have gone about this. I satisfy them and me. Look here, I hold the finished ring on my hand under their noses. They must look like this one if we want to succeed. Have you polished your own ring so that you know how the others must look? Brilla asks sarcastically, looking at the fake ring without any perception. That is exactly what I wanted to know from you, you fool. Don't you see that it is made of copper? I take the ring from my finger and hand it to the two of them. Boy, oh boy, that is quite the thing. They become enthused about the project and stare at the ring from all sides. Man, the most the American will think is that he has received a broken ring. In any case, days will pass before they realise that this time they have lost at the party. Hocker revels happily. Then let's get to work, men. I leave them reassured that things will go forward now. September 1944 While several changes have occurred in the camp in the past seven days, my friends and I carry on with countless hours of work the plan we developed on my birthday. We tell no one of our work, as though under a hypnosis we rasp, hammer, bend and polish wedding rings for the Americans, which they can put in their noses on their wedding days as a reminder of the German prisoners of war in Camp Alençon, who through starvation were forced to such desperate measures. It is nearly ten o'clock. In a few minutes the guards will appear and we will approach them with our export items. Fifteen pieces of jewellery, created from desperation with the most primitive tools, wait in our pockets for their future owners. Everything has been reconnoitred and discussed. Nothing can go wrong. No competition can spoil the business. The price has been set with some flexibility. Only Schultz must be separated because of his striking stately appearance as a salesman. And now, at ten, ten p.m., we step toward the compound exit to smuggle ourselves into other compounds. The fox does not steal where he himself lives. Like this sly animal, I prowl, protected by the night, along the camp road to compound 15 and enter. In the meantime, Hocker and Brilla have reached compounds 2 and 31, which adjoin each other. Unhindered, I mix among the few men who stand at their latrine watching the individual Germans who are at the fence doing business with the Americans. The last hesitancies have been fought back. Determined to get the highest price possible for my idea and work, I step up to the fence and point with my left index finger to the ring on my right hand. An American turns on his lamp quickly and looks at the false piece of jewellery for a second. How many cigarettes? The first interested American asks. No cigarettes food, I demand coldly. OK, this tin. He reaches to hand me a two-pound can out of a clothes bag sitting on the ground. What's in it? I fake fastidiousness. Pork? He answers importantly. Pork? What is pork? I break my head trying to remember. It is very good. He tries to encourage me to take it as I resist. It is very fat pork sausage, my neighbour explains and licks his tongue. OK, I say as though disappointed as I take the ring from my finger. The American shoves two roof rafters between the barbed wire to establish contact while the other guards keep their weapons pointed at me. Contemptuously, I frown and lie the ring on the board. Carefully, the Yankee sets the can on the second board. Drawn by our hands, the objects of exchange pass one another and change owners. With shaking hands, I hold the cold, heavy can in my hands. Caressingly cool, the breeze strokes my hot cheeks as I sail out of the compound. It went all right, I think, and breathe easily once I feel the camp road under my boot soles. Number 19 stands in faded paint on the small wooden board at the entrance to my second field of activity. The strange latrine lies lonesome and lighted by the moon, ghostly, like an open grave before me. There is no guard visible along the corridor. The entire compound appears to have died. Becoming discouraged, I am about to sit down on one of the cross beams of the latrine when I hear a metal clank on the barbed wire. It can only be the weapon of a guard that has struck the wire, I think, 
happily excited, and look in the direction from which the noise has come. Finally, a huge shadow comes closer. Barely perceptible in the milky moonlight are the shiny coat buttons of the American. Why don't you sleep? the unexpected soldier asks. I am hungry, I answer honestly. Are you Nazi? he asks with surprising sharpness. Since I am here, maybe, I respond without thinking. A rash of cuss words streams through the barbed wire upon me, but I cannot understand one word. Suddenly he jerks his left hand out of his coat pocket and throws something, which I presume to be a hand grenade, over the six feet high fence, then continues on his way. Pressed flat on the mound of earth by the latrine, I hear the dull thump of the metal object as it lands just a few steps away. My mind registers that it is a dud after a few seconds pass, and the expected detonation does not follow. Bad luck, you scoundrel. I mumble to myself and search the trampled grass looking for the projectile. Deeply ashamed, I stare at a small can on the bare ground. But still, responding to experience, I resist touching the thing, but instead kneel down and take a close look. Milk, I am able to make out as I strain my eyes. I have to force myself not to laugh. The devil can try to make sense of these damned Americans, shoots through my mind as I shove the can into my pocket and leave the compound. I cross the camp road and enter compound 21. Is anyone there who has a watch to barter, the exchange minister of this compound calls in ordinary black market jargon as I step among the group of prisoners assembled around the latrine. No one responds, with the upper parts of their bodies bent forward, their hands buried deeply in their pockets, bearded and ragged, stand the brave sons of Germany, shaken in despair behind American barbed wire, waiting for a crust of bread that may fall out of the pockets of the well-nourished guards. Filled with rage, I push my way to the fence. Once again, I raise the right hand and point with the left one to the ring on my finger. Two breads entice the two Americans standing between the walls of wire. No bread, only pork, the thick-necked garden dwarf crows to me from under his steel helmet. OK, two cans, I demand boldly, taking the ring from my finger and holding it in my open hand as they shine their light upon it. OK, catch it, cracks the voice of the small one and a can flees over the fence into my outstretched hands. Once again a board slides through the fence. With a light heart, I lie my ring on the altar of our guards. It is broken, both of them cuss at the same time once their light rests again on the piece of jewellery. But their next words are lost on the wind. The person to whom they were directed has already fled to Compound 24 for rest and recovery. Schultz's coat lies heavily on my shoulders as the heavy cans in the pockets await our destruction. A still heavier burden is the doubt weighing on my mind about carrying out the rest of my plan. There was nearly a problem and I would have left empty-handed. We still have three rings to exchange for food. Two cans of pork and one can of milk are now in my possession. Let's go. I drive myself and stride through the compound. No food, only cigarettes, is the laconic answer from my new bartering partner in answer to my approach. Silently I take the package of cigarettes bound with an elastic band from the rifle barrel and hang a ring on the edge of the barrel. The cold eyes of the American, with his finger on the trigger, rest determinedly on my hands and observe sharply their actions. But his concerns are unfounded. I do not intend to withhold my masterpiece from him. Lazily I lift my hand in farewell and disappear into the darkness. You will also think of me. I rejoice inwardly. Leisurely I wander out of the enclosure and turn again toward compound. The guards must have been changed in the meantime. I stand at the entrance listening and looking up to the few stars. Dead silence lies over the camp. The shadows of the row of tents stand gloomily, with their points raised like an index finger in the pale moonlight. There is no inner warning, therefore off to the enemy, I jerk myself and shove off from the post on which I am resting. From far away I discover the guard by the glow of his cigarette. Not entirely sure that the change of guards has taken place, I sit on the latrine crossbeam like an ordinary user and turn my neck in order to make out the figure of the guard. 
Under no circumstances do I want to come into view of the unusual milk giver. Yes, the man along the corridor is smaller than the can thrower. Still, I am reluctant to approach him. In order to draw his attention toward me, I step away from the latrine and in front of the guard stuff my shirt into my pants. Schulz's coat lies thrown carelessly over the parallel beam on which the crossbeam rests. Just then the American flips his cigarette butt in a high arch over the fence near my feet. Don't you smoke? he asks in amazement when I do not jump upon the butt. I am hungry, I repeat my line. Do you have a watch? is the prompt response from the soul of a businessman. Only this ring, I point to my right hand. How much? he asks, slightly interested. Two bread? I respond and reach for Schulz's coat. You get this can? He pulls out one of the familiar cans of pork. Damn it all, I mutter angrily. Just sausage? What? the Yankee asks, since he did not understand. Bread, I repeat my demand. No bread. The man slowly becomes sour. It is good, I explain. I am in agreement, and for the fourth time this evening pull a ring from my finger. The can rolls behind me while the guard sticks his weapon through the barbed wire. Unconcerned, the American draws the ring-decorated barrel back again. Quickly I turn away and pick up the can. Ashamed, the crescent moon hides behind the shreds of clouds after the fraud is finished, and I slip out of the compound. Compound 15 silently admits me. The last ring sits loosely on my finger. Wouldn't it be better to deliver the goods I have acquired to Schultz instead of chancing the last attempt so heavily loaded? No, I order myself and creep like an overcooked profiteer along the fence. A civilian whose story is known throughout the entire camp stands at the concertina wire and speaks every evening, like a wandering preacher, to the guards in perfect English. There is hardly an occupant of a Lent in Alencon, be he German or American, who is not acquainted with his fate. But he takes himself much too importantly, and considers his situation very unusual, even though he notices the mild laughter with which many hear his account for the second or third time. When war broke out with France in 1939, he was living as a rich German tradesman in Paris. At that time the French naturally put him on ice immediately and he was set free by our troops in July 1940. He returned to his comfortable dwelling in Paris and continued his business activities. After August 1944, when the Americans turned Paris over to de Gaulle's troops, he was once again in the hands of the French and landed safely in Alencon. Naturally, he was a civilian and should not have been brought to a prisoner of war camp, but it is a big joke that he continually identifies himself as the most innocent sacrifice of the war among 15,000 of his fellow countrymen. No one is bothered by his daily lamentations, and so he continues to speak on and on. It is only that at the moment he irks me with all the babble out of his gold-filled mouth, and I am afraid he will keep the guard's attention until he is relieved. Do you have anything to exchange? He finally interrupts after I call attention to myself with a cough. I only have my wedding ring, but I will trade it for some provisions, I answer him despondently. Apparently trying to get rid of me so that he can continue to speak, the German acts immediately as an intermediary. The transaction occurs unexpectedly quickly for me. Certainly he has talked the American's ear off, then without looking he shoves the ring into his coat pocket while I shove another can of pork into my pocket, bid them goodbye, and leave the deceived American to his long-winded visitor. My work is over, heavily loaded. I shuffle along the camp road toward the tent that has become my home. The seducer rages in my breast and demands that I open the can of milk I received as a present. I deserve it since I have carried out my assignment to the full satisfaction of my friends. But you are a fool and still believe in the honesty of your world. God be thanked that you are here, Helmut. Schultz greets me at the entrance to the compound. What is it, my boy, that you look at me so disturbed? He asks, concerned, and attempts to read an answer in my face. Nothing, Schultz. I am only happy, finally happy, that you are here and that you waited for me. I answer the good man and feel a relief as the devil in my breast disappears. Hocker and Brilla have been back for nearly an hour. Where have you kept yourself so long, I can tell you? The work paid off. 
even if you did not get anything. But come, let's go to the other two. They have been sitting for a long time in front of the opened cans waiting for you. He whispers hastily and takes me behind our tent to my writing place where Hocker and Brilla greet me with a laugh. Without losing many words, Hocker presents an opened can of pork that he holds between his feet. Without a sound, Brilla tears two loaves of bread apart and holds the not quite equal parts to us with closed eyes. Schultz's silver spoon makes the rounds as each one of us shovels his mouth full and then passes it on to the next. Like animals, we gorge ourselves on the slippery sausage and cram the bread in afterward. After a while, the thought enters my mind that later on, I will only buy this kind of sausage. Full, Hocker asks, looking around the group, answering himself as the empty can slips out of his hand. Full, we wonder ourselves about Hocker's question and shake our heads no. Open another can, Willie, Brilla hisses greedily. That's enough. Schultz counsels against it. We are going to ruin our stomachs. Open it. I shove Schultz's warning to the side because of the insane urge raging in my intestines. Hocker runs the can opener around the lid and smears each portion into our hands. Just like monkeys, we eat the sausage with dirty fingers. We have sunk much lower than the pigs, Schultz mumbles, ashamed, folding his fat hands over his knees. In contemplation, we stare at the five empty cans. The rest, gentlemen, I turn our attention from the gluttony and pull my four cans of pork, the pack of cigarettes, and the can of milk from Schultz's coat pockets. What took you so long? Hocker asks with a concerned voice as my eyes rest on the can of milk. Everything went all right. Just once I had to make a quick exit when the boys discovered the crack in the ring. One of them gave me the can of condensed milk. I just needed more time than we had planned to get around to all of the compounds. I give the truthful answer. But how is it that you returned so quickly? I ask, surprised, looking at the booty they bring out from the hiding place, which far exceeds mine. You fine dandies. I cannot restrain myself as my hands joyfully burrow into the box. In total, the two have acquired twelve cans of pork, two loaves of bread and a box of biscuits. All of this from only three guards, Brilla triumphs with a shameless grin on his face. It was the easiest thing in the world, Hocker smirks proudly. Against your suggestion, we stayed together, and in three quarters of an hour we sold all ten rings in compound two without any incident. None of the boys noticed the swindle. The cans came like hail over the fence after we showed them the rings. We only had to endure a little anxiety. Brilla sums up the experience in military shortness. Then our trick was a success and our work richly rewarded. Now, friends, we just have to secure our success. I end the conversation and get up. Together, Hocker and I lie the entire booty, except for the cigarettes and the small can of milk in the box, which we then bury in the hole that we had prepared. A stone covers our food cellar from the view of the uninitiated. After the work is finished, we rejoin Schultz and Brilla, who were positioned as guards to divert others from our secret work. Restless from the entire event and satisfied that my plan has been carried out, we slip into the tent and lie down on the hard earth for a well-earned sleep, with our stomachs somewhat satisfied. 5. October 1944. For hours a cold rain has been pouring and has changed the entire camp into an unconnected pond. In the neighbouring compound the latrine has overflowed and its stinking broth has penetrated our compound as the former. Meadowland drops sharply in the direction of the city. Shaking with agitation and weakness, the famished comrades push toward the tent entrance and stare, with eyes which have receded into their sockets, at nature's fury. Our thirst has long been quenched, and the faces washed clean of the preceding week's dirt. Others sit silently in their places. A strong wind rips at the tents, and we fear the worst. We four friends are busy outside of the tent cleaning the drainage ditches, making sure that they work properly. Without concern for our soaked clothes, we monitor the tent stakes, which threaten to pull out of the softened earth. Now our extra provisions are of great use. 
then we are the only ones who have the strength to keep the tent anchored in place. Already single tents are blown over by the wind in various compounds and lie crumpled together a few yards distant from their original locations. The American guards stand wrapped in their grey-green raincoats between the barbed wire walls with annoyed faces. Threatened by nature, both guards and their captives are concerned about the posts and ropes which hold up their miserable quarters. Yesterday new prisoners arrived in this blemish on mankind, part of them are sailors assigned to the gun turrets around Paris who were supposed to defend the city on the Seine. They are a colourful, thrown together heap, partly dressed in tropical uniforms with short pants, others in blue navy dress, and some in the grey coats of the Marinese. Among them are the countless clerks from the headquarters in and around Paris. Their uniforms are torn and soiled with blood. Their faces show the horror of the peril they have survived. Today, for the first time, they speak hesitatingly of the mental devastation of their experiences. They were assured by the honour of the French that when they capitulated, they would be well treated according to the provisions of the Geneva Convention. Their understandable distrust was confirmed when the negotiators turned them over to the Americans, who, in something of a demonstration of reassurance, provided them with protection in the form of several tanks. As a Marine reported, they paraded them through Paris after they had laid down their weapons. At the first meeting with civilians, they knew what was in store for them. They were cursed in the most evil manner and had everything possible thrown at them. The closer they came to the city centre, the more audacious the French became. When they finally reached a certain point in the city, there were so many enraged people assembled that the Americans could no longer provide the necessary protection for the prisoners without using weapons against the civilians. But despite the burst of fire from the tank machine guns, the French broke into the ranks of the unarmed Germans and beat them to the ground, tearing insignias, medals, rings and watches from them. It was especially bad for the higher-ranking soldiers who marched in front since the US tanks followed in the rear. According to the report, in one case, less than half of a 350-man company was able to escape the massacre. The rest were thrown into a Paris jail, where it was somewhat tolerable. Not until after numerous interrogations and much suspicion were they delivered to the Americans, who then brought them here. It is understandable that while these men are not pleased with the conditions here, still they are happy to be surrounded by barbed wire and American guards. These descriptions of the conduct of the French, the Grand Nation, cause a flaming hatred to spread throughout the camp. This is understandable because every German soldier remembers how the German leaders insisted that the vanquished French be treated carefully, like they were raw eggs. All too often a German soldier who would have a small conflict with a Frenchman was threatened with arrest. I am describing the accounts by Germans captured in the liberation of Paris during the last week of August 1944. The perspective is certainly that of soldiers, who hoped, if not expected, that they would be treated according to the provisions of the Geneva Convention. The scenes of captors promising soldiers who gave themselves up that they would be well treated, and American troops trying to protect German prisoners of war from an enraged citizenry, were not uncommon throughout the European theatre of war. Even I had experienced the same as I travelled as a prisoner of war through France. Historians have recorded incidents of the mistreatment of German captives after the fall of Paris. David Price Jones, in Paris in the Third Reich, A History of the German Occupation, 1940-1944. Notes, about 12,000 Germans in all were captured, with some 3,000 casualties, indicating that few of the garrisons had attempted to break out. Some surrendering Germans were gunned down, notably in an incident when a grenade was thrown close to a column of prisoners marching around the Etoile, and a machine gun then opened up on them. Martin Blumenson records, When Paris was liberated, the German occupiers suddenly became prisoners, and the Parisians had a chance to take revenge on their enemies. They mutilated portraits of Nazi leaders ripped down swastikas and threw clothes and papers out of buildings where Germans had lived. When the military commander of Paris, General Dietrich von Koltitz, was taken to police headquarters, people spat on him and clawed at his uniform. 
They did not know that Choltitz had saved their city by disobeying Hitler's orders to burn Paris to the ground. Larry Collins and Dominique Lapierre, in their History of the Fall of Paris, is Paris Burning, record. As, little by little, the sound of gunfire slackened in these streets spilling over with sunshine and joy, the occupiers of Paris began a last, sorry parade through the city they had ruled for four years. At the sight of their first sweaty and haggard files, the people of Paris exploded with all the hatred pent up during their long, bitter months of occupation. They beat and pummeled, cursed and spat on them, and, on occasion, killed them. But of the thousands of Germans taken prisoner this sunny day, the sorriest lot of all were the officers of the Gross Paris General Staff. For those men who symbolised the heart of the Nazi tyranny that had oppressed them for four years, the people of Paris reserved a particular violence. All along their path the crowd jeered, spat at them, struggled to leap past the screen of FFI guards to rip at their uniforms, club them, kick their shins. One member of the general staff, Captain Otto Kayser, a literature professor from Cologne, was shot and killed when a screaming Frenchman wearing a blue beret broke into the ranks of the prisoners and, pointing his pistol at the head of the German nearest him, pulled the trigger. A fifth man has joined the four of us, Siegfried Neumüller, a Marine corporal. He arrived here with the last transport and survived the march through Paris. Snuggled close together, we sit in our wet clothes inside the tent on the bare earth and listen to his stories. We are very sympathetic toward him, since his views happen to agree with ours. But he has brought us a present which we would have gladly done without. Lice, since this morning we know. Naturally, these little animals have settled in other tents for a long time already, and it was only a question of time until they would favour us with their pinching. Now they sit in our hair and lay eggs so that their species will not die out. In the French prisons there are swarms of these cursed beasts, Siegfried says as he pulls a prime example out of the red hair on his chest and squashes it with his thumbnail into the next world. But what I wanted to say, he continues his speech, Guderian is really positioned on the Marne with his tanks and ready for a counter-attack. The V-rockets will be heavily used and make the Western Allies ripe for negotiations. As I said, the war is not yet lost. In the Paris prison, they speak with excitement about secret weapons which are soon to be implemented. Naturally, no one knows anything for certain, but the people there are full of hope that they will be freed shortly thereafter. Imagine if the Air Force could drop a battalion of paratroopers and outfit us with weapons. What magic we could work on the backs of the Americans. Do you seriously believe the Air Force still has enough machines? I ask him doubtfully. Yes, he responds. They have only kept them back to deceive the opponent. Now the Americans have all of their equipment on the continent. That is what Führer wants so that he can completely destroy them. It is known that Rommel has two theories. First, to destroy the opponent on the water, and second, to allow him to land, pile up his equipment in France, and then surround and defeat him. The disadvantage of the first plan is that if the enemy is not successful in landing, he can try the invasion at another location. In that case, the many divisions and the available materiel would be a continual threat, which would tie up in France an enormous amount of our strength. The second plan, which the Führer's headquarters selected, also has the disadvantage that some divisions must be sacrificed. It is our personal misfortune that we happen to belong to these companies. But our imprisonment will only last a short time since the Americans are not in a position to ship us away from here in time, although we would be an important pawn in their hands during any ceasefire negotiations. Impressed by his enlightening explanation, we turn on our sides with new hope and doze until it is time to receive our provisions. 2nd October 1944 Comrades, we will sing the first verse of A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The American Protestant chaplain says to those assembled on the camp road, No, I am not imagining it. There stands a pastor in an army uniform and begins to sing. There are no decorations on his chest, only a large cross, the symbol of Christendom. And now the German prisoners of war join in song, softly at first, then louder to the climax, and he shall reign forevermore.
I have come to bring to you the word of God in your troubled existence, he begins his sermon. Jesus Christ did not differentiate between people. You are here as prisoners of this terrible war, but believe me, we are all prisoners on this earth. Imprisoned until the Lord comes to make us free. Do not give up your hope in God. He has not forgotten you here. This beautiful October day is proof, even though it may be hard for some of you to still believe in God because of the hard fate that has come upon you. But who believes in Him will be free, even though He is surrounded by barbed wire. It is possible that mountains can be moved and hills made low. Amen, hallelujah, while the believers return to their tents moved and comforted. Those who remain behind receive the churchgoers with mockery. Are you now satisfied, you stupid sheep? Did he give you the sacrament to keep you from starving? Why didn't you bring anything back for us to eat? The opinions rebound harder and harder until Schultz puts an end to the strife. Stop the theatre now, he calls the fighting roosters to reason. Each can believe what he wants to. Whoever wants to discuss it must do so with the usual respect for the opinion of the other person. By the way, there is enough room outside for the screamers. Did the pastor say anything about the war theatre, or better, about the care and provisions for us? Schultz asks me after he has calmed the waves and we enter the tent in peace. No, he only prayed for us, I answer him indifferently. He could have done that in America. He did not have to make an extra trip here. He closes the topic with light derision and pulls the bill of his cap over his eyes to doze further. October 1944, the five companies selected by the first sergeant stand in the centre of the main camp at attention. The analysts have arrived. They want to examine our political views. A light cloud of irritation lies over the German prisoners standing weak in the rows. What an affront they have allowed themselves against us. What does it matter to these strange people, what we think? That is the last thing they have left us. Now they are reaching for it and want to degrade us from subjects to objects. I recall the radio station, Atlantic, on whose propaganda we were fed before the invasion, as it screamed about the worth of the human being and how Führer was in the process of eliminating humanity. What do they expect from the hearings? Do they seriously believe that each one will actually tell them what he thinks? Or do they believe that we will betray our own people now that we have got to know the Americans? Did they intentionally put us in our present situation so that we would respond with hate-filled words to their questions and they could say we still stand by the Führer, who suddenly attacked the whole world? Now you are to blame for your misery, but we have already prepared our answers, although not one of us knows what we will be asked. The hearings get underway. Twenty paces from each company stand the interrogators and ask their questions of each one as they must step from their rows. Already the spirits are being divided. After a successful hearing, the Americans send those who have been interrogated to the left or right corner of the yard where they are received by the guards. They are dividing us into Nazis and anti-Nazis. It doesn't matter at all what stamp they give us. We must not let ourselves be separated, is Schultz's whole concern. Then you start Schultz. It is up to each one of us individually if we stay together, Hocker suggests. I don't want to hear any criticism from you, if after the hearing they give our camp a bad mark. I am inclined to say what I think, Schultz warns us. We know that, but don't worry. It can't get any worse than it already is, so let's march. I comfort him, as proud as a battalion commander, Schultz steps toward the Americans. He cracks his heels together as he salutes the officer three paces away. The American thanks him idly and Schultz stands comfortably. Slowly the hands turn on our communal nickel watch. It indicates 2.23pm as Schultz proceeds to the larger group in the right corner of the yard and I march forward, preparing myself for the interrogator. At ease is the friendly instruction as his brown eyes take in my profile. You are not one of Himmler's preferred northern types. He opens the conversation. I am from the Germanic tribe of Alemannians. I answer boldly. Do you believe that nonsense? He asks, laughing. It is no nonsense, but the history of my people. I try to enlighten him. Okay, 
He dismisses my answer with a lenient smile. Have you ever participated in an election? No, before I was too young and later as a soldier, I did not have the right to vote, I answer. Do you believe in the final German victory? is his next question. I hope for it, because otherwise the future looks very dark, I respond frankly. Now you are very bitter, but you will get to know a different America. Go to the left corner, he says pleasantly. But I go to the right corner once I am behind his back. Brilla follows my steps after two minutes. Hocker then points with his outstretched index finger to the right corner, and the officer gallantly grants him his free choice. After an anxious wait, we are delighted to receive Siegfried into our crowd. The fear of being separated is over. The hearing was a nice, if ticklish, change of pace. After roll call, the two groups mix back together and return united to the old compound. The cube of pork that was issued as an evening snack has long been digested, and we can still hear from the big mouths how they supposedly told off their interrogators. October 1944. Our situation is almost hopeless. Only a few members of our tent community are moving about in the open. Trade on the fence has stopped. Hardly anyone possesses anything of value. Like stupid, sick animals, we squat or lie with sunken cheeks in our places. No reasonable word passes from our lips. Vexed and quarrelsome because of hunger and thirst, we are tormented spiritually because of the uncertainty and chaos that threaten to break out at any moment. However, few possess the strength to beat up another, though in the eyes of some the fire of madness glows. Dear God in heaven, have mercy on us. A paratrooper in our tent who has become despondent during these days bellows suddenly. He then jumps to his feet and seconds later collapses like an empty sack. Of course, he has enraged the entire crowd, who shower their anger upon him with wild curses because of the disturbance. Schultz and I try to calm the excited ones, although we are not free of the prison psychosis ourselves. In the light of day, everyone must confess that he is seldom capable of a normal thought. Are you normal? Am I normal? Are the Americans normal? What does normal mean? The boundaries have been erased. The world is upside down. Its masters have become insane. Wasn't that a shot? I jump up, startled. It was a shot. A tough East Prussian confirms and rushes out of the tent. We lie down again after no further sounds penetrate the tent from outside. A man has been shot. The East Prussian stands at the tent entrance in shock. Shut your mouth, you idiot! A Rhinelander barks at him, ready to throw his boots at him. It is a fact. They are taking him to the doctor. The bringer of bad news insists, wringing his hands. If you are lying, the devil take you. And if it is true, the Americans... Schultz responds and goes outside. The fellow is crazy. The Americans would not go that far is the opinion of those in the tent who have not troubled themselves about the situation, and they continue to doze, shut up quiet, is the only utterance they make about this turbulent situation. The man is dead, shot. A blast directly into the breast, right by the garbage pile. The guard is standing there looking at him. Shaken, these words fall from Schultz's mouth in the room. I must see the face of the murderer. I hear myself say after a pause and go out of the tent. The prisoners stand in groups close to another and stare at the guard, whose eyes circle the compound nervously. What could have caused him to fire this carefully aimed shot? To simply shoot down an unarmed prisoner of war during the bright of day? If he is insane, why does he not fire another deadly round into the crowd? An officer with four soldiers comes and places him in the middle. Willingly, he allows them to take the weapon from his shoulder. Unruffled, he takes the first steps toward prison, we hope. A mighty animosity has seized the entire camp. Immediately, the Americans strengthen the guards. Thoughtful men admonish peace, but the rumours act as poison among the inmates as they wind their way into every corner and find listeners everywhere. The camp is in an uproar, the weak nerves of the starved men are enraged and the gun barrels of the nervous Americans are pointed threateningly into the compounds. Finally, after an hour, a calming or at least diverting rumour circulates that a colonel, 
the commander of the prisoner of war camp at Le Mans, has arrived up in the main camp and will set things right. The rumours stumble over themselves. Four o'clock, witnesses to the murder are to be taken up to the Americans. 4.30, the colonel is in the camp. Five o'clock, the commander of the Alencon camp has been taken into custody. 5.15, the whistle sounds for distribution of food. Let's go, Schultz breathes to Brilla and takes up his manifest to go with us to the provisions tent. Now, what is going on here today? We nudge each other as the carriers from cage 10 pass by us, heavily loaded. Today is the last meal. They tell us to our astonished faces as a truck rolls up to the tent and new provisions are unloaded. This time, no one returns empty-handed. Everyone has a box on his shoulder. Tent chiefs come and get the provisions, Schultz calls. A can of pork for every four men, about 240 grams for each man, and for each man a small package of cracker bread. Silently we receive the gigantic portions, like animals we gobble them down. The group then lies on the ground without moving. Death has reached into the camp today. October, 1944. The sun hangs blood red in the west over the ocean, and with its last rays turns to gold, the drops of rain hanging on the rusty barbed wire, so that they glimmer like fiery rubies. The day comes to an end. Still camped on this foreign meadow on the edge of Alencon are German soldiers, prisoners of the United States of North America. But we have reason to hope that things will begin to improve for us. Since yesterday we receive provisions three times a day. The individual portions have been doubled for each meal. Milk, butter, white breed and sugar, all the things we have only known in freedom, are now a part of our daily fara. Who is in a position to be sure what joy has been brought into the hearts of the once confused prisoners of war? But one had to be a random sacrifice to set the stone in motion. Not one of us knows for sure what really transpired. The guard as well as the former commandant have been taken from here. It is further rumoured that up to now the available provisions had been shifted to the French. In any case, even our first sergeant has not been seen by any camp inmate since October 26th. The guards are correct and committed to making our hard situation easier. Today blankets were issued, but the rumours state that the entire camp is going to be disbanded and cleared out. Now, for us at the moment at least, next to a happy return home, there is no greater wish than to leave this hell. I still sit at my place behind the tent. When we arrived here, the barbed wire was new and sparkled like freshly poured lead. Now it sags and is covered with rust between the barbs. The raindrops have stopped. A hateful wetness lies on the wire. Each man should take a piece of it with him home so that he will be protected from now on from petty and narrow-minded views. Come in my tent, my boy. It is cold. Schultz tears me out of my contemplation. Here, Schultz. Shouldn't we secure a piece of the barbed wire as a souvenir from Alençon? I ask him and pull at the wire. We are still here, my friend. I will never forget this spot on the globe, even without a souvenir. Now come and let's drink our milk before it is completely dark. 1st October 1944. All sergeants are to report on the camp road with their blankets and personal belongings. A call sounds immediately over the graves of the still living prisoners of war in Alencon. Finally, it is true. Chacun, we stare at one another. Some shake their heads in unbelief. To leave Alencon alive, that must be a mistake. How many years have we been here? Are we the last survivors from the Great War? Hurry up, get ready, you fools. Don't stand there like blockheads looking for additional holes in your rotten socks. Brilla thunders and rolls his eyes like a wild boar. And now, Hocker asks, the dimples having left his cheeks. Temporarily only a better camp, Willie, is my answer. Whether it is a better grave, that must be confirmed. Schultz mixes in, Poland is not yet lost. In a short time we will be free, so let's go. Siegfried drives us out of the tent. Dirty, full of lice, torn, gaunt, a stinking pile, the refuge of the war. That is what assembles on the camp road. A few more than 800 non-commissioned officers of the great German army are counted. 
Is it really eleven, twelve, or fourteen weeks since all these men stood with weapons in their hands against the enemy, instilling fear and horror in them? Unbelievable, but it is really so. Here, Staff Sergeant Robert Briller, thirty-two years old, a member of my division. The picture of the ideal soldier, powerfully built, a brunette with a slightly receding forehead, black, jovial eyes, hawk nose, small, turned-up lips, and a vigorous chin, I got to know him in the hospital in Auxerre. At first he imposed himself on me, but later he proved to be a brave soldier and a good comrade. Well acquainted with nearly all the battlefields and whorehouses of this war, he is an example of the modern farm boy. Then Sergeant Willie Hocker, twenty-six years old, a small fellow, blonde and blue-eyed, a slightly turned-up nose and a girl-like mouth and chin. Always open to the joys of life, he was a soldier of undaunted bravery. A survivor of my division, I got to know him in Paris, where our mutual affinity sealed the unbreakable bonds of friendship. From that moment on, in good as well as bad days, my trusted companion. I now beg to heaven that our future paths will never be separate. The vehicles have arrived and the provisions distributed. The resurrected look at the searchers that have arrived. What do you want? Yes, we know, it is your duty. But put on your gloves, you men from God's own land, otherwise you will be infected with the pestilence in our lousy pockets. The road looms before us, the searchers become helpers. Either with humour or in seriousness, according to their individual nature and temperament, they assist the weak into the trucks. The black drivers start up the motors. In the American camp, the American flag is raised. It is eight o'clock in the morning, a bugle sounds. Do we hear the trumpets from Jericho? Schultz says with a broken voice and wipes his eyes. Slowly the black soldiers drive their dishonoured white freight out of the camp and turn into the road. Behind the barbed wire walls stand thousands waving a tired goodbye to us men who in the next days will follow us. Before we reach the first houses, the name of the city stands on a bent sign a city that will remain burned in the consciousness of more than 20,000 German prisoners of war. Alencon. The city is behind us. Quickly the convoy speeds to the south. Our beards flutter like flags in the wind. Although our eyes have a free and unhindered view over the land coloured by fall, no one sees the beauty of nature. No sound comes from the lips of those raped by the war and barbed wire. A glance into the eyes of our comrades is enough to know. We have escaped. But have we really? Mistrust is still awake. No one has said where they are taking us. Only the motor of the truck sings a monotonous sound, as though it was happy itself to take us away from here. At 2pm we reach Le Mans, turn right from the main street, and our goal is in sight. An ocean of barracks and tents, snuggled between low pines and soft ground swells, appears before us. Joyfully agitated, we discover frail smoke clouds rising up from the oven pipes in the kitchen barracks. Where there is smoke, there is fire. Where there is fire, there are people. Where there are people, there is cooking. And where there is cooking means that we will finally get something warm to eat. Dear God, why can't we leave the truck? Why is the convoy turning onto the open meadow? What are the many American soldiers for? Do they really think we could still escape? Please leave the trucks and line up in five rows, a German staff sergeant orders. With feet like clay we drag ourselves to the assembly place. We are divided into companies. Company leaders are appointed. The American searchers touch us with disgust, but now the blacks come, armed with spray cans and sacks, from which they shake white powder as they go through the open ranks. Unbutton your shirts and pants, the staff sergeant laughs, and soon the blacks are spreading their pulverised poison in the dirty, louse-infested clothes of the men from Alencon. Covered in white like flour mill workers, we stand and follow with all our senses the running and crawling across our skin as the lice poison begins to work. Relieved, we breathe easily as the tenants give up the ghost. Man, that worked, is the expression from all. The march into the camp begins. The guards have opened the wide gates and allow us to pass by, simply shaking their heads. 
We make our way into cage three by way of a wide asphalt street which is cleanly washed on both sides and lined with well-fed German soldiers who stand without speaking and as they look at us do not know whether to laugh or cry. Minutes later, Schultz has divided his company into the barracks. Satisfied, we observe our new quarters. A sparkling clean room with straw strewn along the wall on the wood floor. Finally, solid housing, just as quickly as one heartbeat follows the other. We lie down on our backs on the soft straw which smells of summer and thank the gods for our salvation. But before we are overcome with sleep, the door is thrown open and a man dressed in the white work clothes of a cook appears and calls us to receive our food. Whether we are awake or dreaming is not clear, but we do get up and step outside in an instant. In the front of each barrack stand three tin containers, out of which steam rises and whose smell threatens to completely confuse our tormented spirits. With the last bit of energy, Schultz is successful in getting the men into rows and distributes to them the cans with hot food. And now it is my turn. With the feeling of a predatory animal that smells blood, I step up to the bucket and hold with shaking hands my two cans under the ladle, which has a capacity of about one litre. The can in my left hand is filled with spinach, meat and gravy. Five potatoes about the size of tennis balls are placed in the other can. As quickly as possible I hurry to a sand hill and kneel to set down the cans that have become very hot. Carefully I begin to peel a potato with my fingernails, until suddenly all reason leaves me and in an animal. Like eating frenzy I shovel the potatoes with their skins into me, mixing the gravy and spinach into a fluid to help swallow down the potatoes. After I have also gulped down the meat I drop to my side exhausted. Black curtains appear before my eyes. I feel sick as a dog. My stomach is turned inside out. My neck is stretched. My first warm meal trickles into the sand. Mechanically, I once again shovel in the unchewed pieces of potato. That was a bad move, my dear, Hocker whispers to me, annoyed as I open my eyes. Damn it anyway, how can that happen to me? I ask, looking at him in amazement as he calmly eats his food in small bites using Schultz's spoon. Calm yourself. Take a look around. All of them are throwing up. Is his entire comfort. We lie warm and cosy in the straw. The nausea has eased and my stomach is as empty as a drum. It is 6pm. From outside they call for us to get our tea. Are you feeling better? Brilla breathes in my ear. Somewhat. I do feel a little better, I smile feebly. What do you think of this hotel? he asks, squinting roguishly with his left eye. It's okay until something better comes along, I answer, satisfied. Earlier the mess sergeant was with Schultz. According to what he said, the Allen owners, as they call us here, are to receive extra provisions. He maintains that in less than four weeks he will have us back to our old selves, the good-hearted Brilla reports, full of hope. Then let them bring on the food. We have to eat by ourselves. I grin at him happily. Keep it to yourself this time, he teases, and don't spit it in the sand again. It was just too hot and I ate it too fast. That will be a lesson for me. I nod to him. Here, you lazy stinkers. Hocker hands up a gigantic can of wonderfully smelling hot tea. Man, where did you get that pail? We stammer at the same time to the freshly washed hocker. Did you fall into a teapot? You shine like a monkey's ass. Brilla asks him and carefully takes the handle of the cup after I have carefully taken a few sips of the sweet tea. No. He beams all over his face. There is running water in the camp. I am going crazy, water lines here in this cage, I ask, unbelieving. Are there also cleaning girls who will fluff up the straw? Brilla bursts out laughing causing the tea to go down the wrong pipe. Boy, that cup is the size of a marmalade bucket. Tell me, where do you get one of those things? The old farm boy wants to know. There is a whole mountain of them behind the kitchen barracks, Hocker informs him. And how is it with the water lines, I ask, in danger of being laughed at? Come with me and see for yourself. He acts insulted. Come on, old man, we are going to go wash. I encourage Brilla. I can't do it right now. Look here. My legs are swollen, he says, pointing.
pointing to his bloated calves and ankles. You must go to the doctor, Robert. That is a bad sign, I say firmly so that he will not pass it off. Then I follow Hocker out of the room. Surprised, I stop in my steps. In the meantime, it has become night, but in the camp, it is still quite bright. I am astonished. I clear my throat and blink at the electric lights. Like a mountain spring, the silver water dashes heavily over my hands. Childlike, men are playing in the cold wetness. There is water, friends. Drink yourself dead and you will die happy, a half-crazy shrieks. Now for a towel and soap, Willie. Then we could really get clean, Hocker expresses across from us. Even that hour will come, Helmut. You can count on it. He comforts me optimistically, while I take out my dirty handkerchief and wash it for the first time in weeks before I wipe off my face and hands with it. And now listen up for a minute. Schultz speaks to his people as we enter the barracks again. The Americans require that we keep order and discipline. We are responsible to keep the camp clean. Streets and walks must be kept clean all the time. The same goes for our quarters. In order to organise the cleaning details, I think that we should organise a work detail of volunteers who will be rewarded with extra provisions. I would appreciate it if the longest in rank would take on the responsibility as barrack leader and those who wish to work can report to them. As far as I can tell in the other barracks, there are enough men who are ready to work. I don't need to tell you that you don't have to work yourself to death. Whoever is willing to work for extra provisions, please raise your hands. Thank you, there are more than enough. Who is the oldest in rank? Your name, comrade. Good, Staff Sergeant Meyer, is assigned as barracks leader here. Who wants to work can report to him. Schultz ends his work for the day as company leader and lets himself fall exhausted into the straw. For the first time I notice that his beard has been shaved and his hair cut. The upper part of his face is very pale but free of dirt. He smells of soap, and now, friends, he lifts his head just once out of the straw. Sleep well. We will see our homeland again.